Hello, hello. Welcome everyone to our Defend Black History Storytelling Workshop. It is 401 Pacific Time. I'm currently located in Oakland, California. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. I know you could be doing other important things, but you decided to be here on the right side of history, and I am very thankful. Before we dive in, I would love for you all to put in the chat if you came to our last school board training. Let us know if you were there? What takeaways do you have from that? Drop in your name. Again, I am Karina Petty with Color of Change. Drop in your pronouns. I'm she, her, her. My location is Oakland, California. And what Black history means to me is what we're doing tonight is defending it to ensure that our my son, our family, and our friends understand what our history means for us. Again, put in the chat, y'all. Where are you located? What's your name? What's your pronouns? All right. I see Florida in the house. I see Michigan. I see Columbus. I see Texas. I see North Carolina. Okay. New York. Did anyone join our last school board training? Hey, Cedric, thanks for joining. If you did, let me know in the chat. Let me know in the chat if you attended. But again, we want to thank you all for being here today. I see Tennessee in the house. All right. Yvette, you were at the last training. Thank you so much for being here on our workshop day. We are super excited to get started. We can go to the next slide. All right, today you will be hearing from NEA and Color of Change on how you can lean into power by showing up at your local school board meeting to defend Black history. This summer, Color of Change went through a massive restructure, y'all. We are restructuring our work across the organization as we are fo uh, facing drastic financial changes. We lean into our issue-based campaigns, working as we continue to work to make tangible changes that improve Black lives. And that is why we are here today. The power of our squad and many of you, I see familiar names, is rooted in members showing up to demand accountability and working together to improve our community. As we sharpen our strategy, we will continue to create trainings, resources, materials for our squads and members across the country to engage in local action to build black to build power for Black people. With this restructuring, you'll see here Sierra, myself, Sherelle, who is with NEA, You'll see that our compartment has been combined to dream again while doing our best to make the world a less hostile place for Black people. So again, put in the chat where you're located. Second training, Robin, appreciate you all. Oh, New Mexico in the house. Okay. I see New York again. Welcome to our school board workshop, training workshop. And now I just want to talk about the next slide here. This is what we're going to cover today. So we'll have a welcome and remarks and conversation with the president of NEA, Becky, and our president of Color Change, Rashad. And then our storytelling workshop will include icebreaker activities where we'll break bread, build community together. We'll talk about the training, right? Because we want to know what we're doing before we do it. We'll talk about how we can craft our story uh, if you were at the last training, I shared my own personal narrative that that was the first time that I shared it with you all. So we're going to get on the bike and then we're going to review our learnings and take action. Next slide. You may remember these community agreements from our previous trainings, but I would like to review them again. Um, folks are already engaged in the chat. Um, I actually see here folks are saying what Black history means for them. They're letting us know where we're located. But this chat could also be places where you ask questions, where you affirm for folks, where you let us know how we're doing. So again, use the chat and reactions to engage. During our training and session today, we encourage everyone to build community. We are all like-minded individuals here. We are here to the purpose to defend Black history and help others understand what's at stake. Show love. Again, engage in the chat. If someone is sharing a bomb story or if you like somebody's energy, if you like somebody's hair, come off, not come off mute, <laughs> go into the chat and just show some love. Respect others as you would respect yourself. Ask questions. Again, we may not have all the answers, but put the question in the chat. And if we don't have the answer, we will for sure find it and take action. The point of today Today is for us to all understand that there is a power in our stories and our personal narratives. A lot of time, Black people specifically are told that our stories don't matter. We don't have safe or courageous spaces to share them. So here at Color of Change,
change. We understand the power in organizing, the power in people is to engage with one another, is to break bed with one another, is to laugh with one another. So I just want to encourage you all to remember these agreements so that way we can do what we can um, to show up at our local school board and say what we need for our, our family, for our friends, for our kids. Um, so I am going to welcome Kyle Bibby, who is Chief of Campaigns and Programs here at Color of Change, passing it over to you. And next slide, please. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Kyle Bibby, the Chief of Campaigns and Programs at Color of Change. I'm calling in from Jersey City, New Jersey, and I am excited to join you all today and moderate this very important discussion leading into today's Defend Black History School Board Training. Color of Change and the National Education Association have come together in partnership to fight back against the attacks on black history and ensure there's truth in education. Together, we're building a multicultural grassroots movement made up of educators, parents, students, and others across our community united as one. Together, we'll ensure that the attacks on our history in schools do not prevail and will preserve our legacy and uphold our democracy. Uh, through a series of the following events, our organizations will bring in together members and supporters from across the nation, will tell our stories, and fight for our students' education. Uh, some people in the room may have been uh, invited by Color of Change, others from the National Education Association or some coalition partners. So in case you aren't familiar, I'm going to take a, a bit of time to give a quick introduction to the two host organizations and set the stage for remarks uh, from the COC, uh, Color of Change, and NEA, National Education Association presidents. So um, the National Education Association is the largest union of educators in the country with more than 3 million members. That includes elementary and secondary school teachers, higher ed faculty, education support professionals, and students preparing to become educators. Color of Change is the country's largest online racial justice organization with millions of members nationwide. And those two organizations have come together to defend black history and truth in education for all students. As I mentioned earlier, some of you are educators, students, parents, others are representatives of organizations or organizers and concerned community members from across the nation. So given the breadth of experiences and people in the room, we are gonna play a 90 second video to give context that frames today's conversation uh, and lays out the groundwork for the sub subsequent uh, school board trainings today. So Aaron, could you please play the video? Book bans. Ban specific books. Banning additional books. Book bans. Book bans. Book bans. History is our greatest teacher and we cannot learn from its mistakes if it is hidden from our shelves. The removal of voices that speak to the Black experience and the marginalization of Black heroes isn't just a ban on literature. It's an attack on Black history, on our ability to build a fair and just society. We will not go quietly. We are holding elected officials and book publishers accountable. We are demanding they fight with us to reverse legislation that bans our history. But the fight isn't over. We'll continue to organize a grassroots fight against those who threaten to erase us by giving our communities tools to defend themselves. Together, we'll stand against the whitewashing of our libraries by refusing to be silenced. Because Black history is American history. Our stories of resistance and brilliance matter. Join us in ensuring future generations learn from voices of the past. Part of what we have to do in terms of activism is make people believe that they can fight for something that they actually can't necessarily touch, yes. that they haven't experienced, but to believe by coming together that something more is possible. We need to be able to learn about others and we will continue to fight. We need you to show up at your school board meetings and fight for this. This is our history. It is our children history. So we need you to show up and help fight for it. All right. So uh, as you can see, uh, there's there's a lot at stake for our children's education. Uh, I know that uh, you all are here today because you care and you're probably wondering how you can get in this fight, share your story, connect and share resources. And we're happy to help you. 
That's what the training is about today. So with that being said, there isn't a better person to give opening remarks for our training today than Becky Pringle. Uh, Becky Pringle is the NEA president and a fierce social justice warrior, defender of education rights, an unrelenting advocate for all students and communities of color, and a valued and respected voice in the education arena. A middle school science teacher with more than three decades of classroom experience, Becky is singularly focused on using her intellect, passion, and purpose to unite the members of the largest labor union in the nation and use that collective power to fulfill the promise of public education. I'll turn it over to you, Becky. Thank you so much, Kyle. It's good to be with you again and for those who are joining us again and to those who are joining us for the first time. I am so proud to be here today representing the three million members of the National Education Association. I know some of our members have joined us again tonight and I am so thankful. You know, Kyle, in addition to being a middle school science teacher, I am also the daughter of a history teacher, a father who took very seriously his responsibility to teach the students in his classroom and the students in his home, my sisters and I. When we were children, my dad took us on, on a trip so that we could learn the truth about our family's roots. He wanted my sisters and me to absorb the story of us. I still remember our trip to Charlottesville, Virginia where he took us to stand on the soil where our enslaved family members stood and toiled. And I can remember, you know, almost viscerally feeling their, their tears. And, um, and I also uh, learned about all of the things they did, not to just make it through, but to prepare those who would come after them to take our place and take up the struggle that they had engaged in throughout their entire lives. My dad's greatest hope was that we would never forget our painful yet our proud history. If he were alive today, oh my goodness, I wish I could talk to him. Um, it would break his heart to see the war on truth and history raging in classrooms all over this country, the war against educators who simply want to live up to their professional and moral responsibility to teach the truth uh, of the times this nation exceeded its expectations and the times when we fell woefully short and to connect that history to what's happening right now. I tell you this about myself because I know the power of sharing our stories. I know the power of others understanding of why this work is so important to us as educators, why our babies, our students are our priority. That is why this training is so important. Together we must and we will reclaim public education as a common good in this country. We know that public education is the foundation of this or any democracy. We also know as educators, we can't stop there. We actually have to join together to transform public education into something it was never designed to be, a racially and socially just and equitable system that prepares every student, every single student to succeed in this diverse and interdependent world. Because educators cannot do this work alone, we must and we will join with parents and students and families and communities all standing together, demanding that educators have the freedom to teach and that our students have the freedom to learn. We cannot and we will not allow politicians to grasp and hold on to power by fueling fear and division and limiting our students' access and opportunities to an honest and accurate education. After this training is over, I ask that you continue to educate yourself and others about school board candidates, and then use what you learn to vote for pro-public education candidates up and down the ballot. As I said during the event last week, 
School boards determine what happens in our schools and our students' classrooms. That means they should represent what our entire community cares about, not just the select few. As you learn how to transform your personal experiences into powerful stories, I urge you to root them in these words from Dr. King. Let us rise up with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination and let us move in these challenging times. These times, these powerful days to take this opportunity to make America a better nation. Thank you for joining us tonight and thank you for joining us in this struggle. Thank you so much for those opening remarks, Becky. And as you mentioned, these attacks are coming because public education is the foundation of an inclusive democracy, economy, and society. Our partnership, Color of Change and the National Education Association is one to ensure that the fight we are mounting is inclusive and matches our values. And Color of Change strives to be the political home of Black people. So now I'd like to also welcome Rashad Robinson to the stage, who is uh, the president of Color of Change, a racial justice organization with more than 7 million members. Under Rashad's leadership, Color of Change led the $7 billion advertiser boycott of Facebook, changed how crime, policing, and race are represented on TV, won net neutrality as a civil rights issue, and devise innovative strategies to hold decision makers accountable to black communities, from local prosecutors to multinational corporations. Rashad's analysis, advocacy, and activism is known nationwide, and he's frequently featured in national media. He's also one of the co-chairs of the Aspen Institute's Commission on Information Disorder. So Rashad, welcome. Uh, and to kick off this discussion, I wanna aim my first question at you. Uh, I know Becky set the stage with her opening remarks, uh, but can you give our, um, you know, the folks here today for the training an understanding of what's at stake? Rashad, I think you might be, uh, I think you might be muted for a second. I don't know if you want to troubleshoot. Still not hearing you. You know, while we give you a second to troubleshoot, why don't I, um, I could take my next question um, to Becky. Um, so I know leading the nation's largest union, <laughs> uh, led by uh, teachers and, and populated by teachers, uh, can you explain to us what it is that you're hearing from educators? Uh, certainly, uh, Kyle, and it's good to be with you again, Rashad. Um, um, we, our, our union actually uh, encompasses not just our teachers, but also our education support staff, uh, paraprofessionals and bus drivers and school uh, secretaries, as well as school nurses and counselors, um, higher education faculty. Um, we um, together uh, not only teach our students, but nurture them and feed them and drive them and uh, uh, listen uh, and make sure that we provide them uh, as the whole students they are with all of the supports that, that they need. Um, so as I travel around the country, I, I get the opportunity to ask educators uh, lots of questions and I do ask them. Uh, to talk to me about the impact of, of uh, book bans and other an, uh, anti-woke laws and, and uh, the fact that there are so many laws now that have been passed that are anti-LGBTQ+. And I will tell you, Kyle, that uh, sometimes I do encounter educators who, uh, because the laws are so um, purposely vague, that they are, are self-censoring themselves in their or their classroom libraries and, or, or talking about um, Black History Month or, or, or Pride Month. And so one of the things that we have been doing is making sure that educators know their rights, that they know what laws say and what they don't say so that they can stand in that truth uh, uh, firmly planted in what what their what the law in their state says, um, and that they know that their union is there to defend their right to teach our students 
the true and complete history of this country. But I will tell you, Kyle, the vast majority, I, I'm just so proud of them. I'm so proud of all of our educators who are coming together. They are using their voices in ways that resonate with parents and community members. They're fighting back against uh, these restrictive laws. And, and, when, and, and when they're not able to do that, Kyle, they're actually running for office themselves. That's what they're doing. They're making sure that people are in positions, um, elected positions and appointed positions, who, are, uh, who care about our kids and care about our communities and, and care about our country. And so I, I will tell you that they are standing strong and they are not backing down, but they can't do it alone. That's why we're doing this together. They can't do it alone. They need our parents. They need other community members. They need other voices that are joining them in this fight to ensure that they have the right to teach and our students have the right to learn. Thank you for sharing that. Definitely. Um, and I think uh, I think we have Rashad back now. So uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. can hear you. <laughs> great, great. The magic, the magic of technology. Right. Everyone. Oh, yeah, we got all this great technology connect folks. Yeah. And then sometimes yeah. it just doesn't switch on. But all right. Um, so Rashad, uh, I was saying before and, you know, um, Becky was talking about the experience that a lot of educators are having and how that impacts the community. Can you explain again, like what's at stake for uh, the nation, for our children and our communities as a whole? Well, our very future is at stake. And, you know, it was really beautiful to hear Becky's opening and her talking about her uh, family's legacy, about their history, both the stories that she learned as a young person, but being able to combine that with her education and her teaching. And in so many ways, that's what is um, that's the attempt. That's what's being stolen from us. That's the goal of this project. When more people learn about things like redlining and voter suppression and the history of discrimination, people are more likely to want to fight for a better tomorrow. People of all races are going to want to come together. Our, our history, the history and the story of Black history is obviously the story of Black leadership, Black innovation, Black struggle, but it's also the story of multiracial groups of people coming together to fight for a better tomorrow. And that's also what they want to suppress. They want to suppress our interest and belief that we can work together, we can fight together, and we can win together. You know, I in, in as we were getting started, I saw um, people listing out where they were from and all the various places. And you saw people from the east, the west, the middle, the north, the south. I come from a small community on Eastern Long Island, Riverhead. Uh, my family got there through the great migration, the farm fields, my great grandparents, the farm fields of Virginia to the farm fields of Long Island, going there to work on the farm. And my family has lived there ever since. I, I live in New York City, but I remember growing up and going to school board meetings, going into the voting booth with my grandfather and my parents, getting to pull that lever, having conversations about who was going to run for school board. And in so many ways, those were the conversations. Those were the stories that helped shape my belief that a better tomorrow is possible. And then we have to fight. So as we are in these trainings about telling our story, as we are in these trainings about what does it mean to fight, I hope that you are not only thinking about how you will go into the spaces and the places to fight, but how we continue to educate the next generation behind us, how we bring these stories to our young people and introduce why we stand up, why we work together. The future is at stake. Our very ability to be able to have a democracy that is on our side is at stake. And that is why this struggle is so important. That is why we at Color of Change are so focused and so engaged in this effort. And that's why we're so proud to be partnering with the NEA, whose efforts and engagement on behalf of students and teachers is in direct alignment about what does it mean to make sure that public education is free, open, and accessible to all of us. Thank you for sharing that. And you know, you, you spoke a bit about um, your experiences uh, growing up and, and you know, uh, interacting with school board meetings and such. Uh, as a quick follow up again to you, Rashad, uh, why is it important now more than ever that we attend these school board meetings and we vote in school board elections and get engaged specifically there? Well, you know, it, it all mixes together, right, Kyle? So at, at, at Color of Change, you and your team is, are doing such 
incredible work right now. Sometimes holding textbook companies accountable, holding um, um, education companies accountable, making sure that black history uh, curriculum is not whitewashed, making sure that we are forcing the right conversations um, you know, into the um, curriculum um, and making sure our teachers and our students are supported in all the ways necessary. But that outside pressure is incredibly important but day in and day out in the kind of rooms of power at, at school board meetings, decisions are being made. Decisions are being made about the budget. Decisions are being made about what to prioritize. And people will speak for us and for our children and for our communities if we are not there to speak up for ourselves. Um, other people will make decisions on our behalf and other people will make decisions um, that are in their interest, not in our interest. And so, you know, democracy is a participation sport. Uh, we have to get out and participate if we want to even be in the game. And, um, and that, right, for all of us who are sort of, um, who have taken some time in the afternoon or the evening, depending on where you're at um, and what coast you're at or whether you're in the middle of the country, you know, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for giving your time um, during this holiday season. I want to thank you for uh, believing that fighting together um, is a meaningful um, use of your time. And I also want to um, thank you for helping um, use your story and leverage your story to be able to help us win more. You know, when I think about storytelling, Kyle, and I just want to end on this point, storytelling is so incredibly important. Far too often we talk about inequality as unfortunate rather than unjust. And what I mean by that is we talk about uh, inequality like it just happened, like it's a car accident. Mm -hmm. Not that it's being manufactured by folks that are making all sorts of choices every day. And when we tell stories about inequality as unfortunate rather than unjust, people want to give us charitable solutions to structural problems. And this is why we need you showing up to those school board meetings, because they'll say, we just need more after school programs instead of actually fully funding public education. They'll say, let's send more water bottles to Flint or Jackson, Mississippi, instead of actually cleaning up the pipes and making sure our young people have fully clean water. They want us to give us charity rather than structural change. And day in and day out, we have to fight for the type of funding, we have to fight for the type of resources, and we have to fight for the type of curriculum, resources, and engagement that are actually going to serve all of our young people. And so that is what is so incredibly important. But how we tell our stories and where we put the emphasis is going to be so incredibly important to getting more people, your friends, your family, your neighbors, investing in the fight that is ahead of us. Such a great point. You know, I, I it's, it's you brought up the, uh, you know, injustice and uh, versus, uh, you know, inconvenience, I think it was, you know, I, I tell our team often that, um, you know, as much as we organize and we campaign, there are other people out in the streets, our opposition that is organizing too. So we have to be tenacious, right? Mm -hmm. um, so to Becky, um, you know, we also spoke, uh, Rashad was speaking about speaking out in public at these uh, community uh, meetings, uh, the public comment section portion, particularly at public school board meetings uh, or when resolutions are up for public comment, that's a real critical moment for students, teachers, and educators uh, to leverage and engage for change. Um, why should people speak up and why is telling our personal narratives such a powerful organizing tool? So first of all, um, elected people need to know you're watching, you're paying attention. And you're going to hold them responsible, accountable. Um, you're going to help shore them up when they are doing things in the best interest of our, our students and our schools. Um, and when you speak up, when you, when you use your voice and you tell your stories about what they are doing or not doing that is helping or harming your child, when you tell those stories, you are actually tapping into something uh, that since the beginning of time, we know to be true, right? That our brains are, are hardwired for stories. And the reason that's true is because you're making connections. 
with, within your brain. And, and those connections then translate into connections between what your core values are and the core values of other people. You know, we, we talk about all the division within our country, sometimes within our very, uh, in our community, sometimes within our very families, right? There, 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 there are, um, there are controversies or, or people believe uh, perhaps different things. But one of the things we've learned over these last couple of years in particular is that more people have the same core values as us than don't. Yeah. And we may not agree all the time on what the strategy is or what the tactic is, but if you get down to that core value, you tap into something really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And you do that by telling your story. And when people hear those stories, when other people hear those stories, even like-minded people, Kyle, when they hear those stories, they actually, they make the connections too. And it helps them tap into their own courage and their own ability, ability to inspire other people to actually act, to make a difference. And what we have seen across the, this nation, which is so powerful, is that when people understand that they actually have the power, they have the power yeah. to change people's minds. They have the power to change policy. And by the way, if they aren't able to change policy, they have the power to change the policy maker. That's powerful. That's powerful. All that's done mm -hmm. through telling of stories, making connections, lifting up your voice. All right, thank you for sharing. And and um, Rashad, uh, you know, this group is about to go into a training uh, where they're going to learn about how to use their personal narrative for social justice. Uh, I'd like to give you a moment for some closing remarks before we begin the training. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you like to say to the audience as they prepare? First of all, thank you. Thank you for joining with us. Thank you for continuing to raise your voice, for continuing to stand with us as we fight and we fight back, but we also push forward. The best Defense is an offense. And this is not just about protecting the things that we've won over the years, but this is about continuing to advance and expand and finding all the ways to continue to win the type of victories that will make um, our education system accessible for all of our young people and give all of our young people the tools and the investments that they need and they deserve. We cannot mistake our presence for power. Visibility, awareness of these issues is important, but power is the ability to change the rules. And how we change the rules is by getting invested and involved and focused, focused on this work and working to deal uh, with those that stand in our way, building the type of campaigns and the energy and telling our stories in powerful ways, getting more people to show up, invested and involved. Five, 10, 15 years from now, we will look back at this moment. We will think about what we did and how we showed up. And I hope that each and every one of us can be proud of how we took our time, um, our investments, our engagements, and fought for a better tomorrow together. So let's get out there and let's continue to build. Let's continue to work together so we can tell the stories in the years ahead about the ways in which we came together in these moments of attack and built a new set of progress for the years ahead. Let's fight for progress. Let's fight for a better tomorrow. And most of all, let's fight for our young people because that is what's at stake. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your time. And, um, and let's get out here and tell our stories. Can't hear you, Karina. You're on mute, I think. Yeah. Thank you. I am definitely on mute. Thank you for that. Um, but again, want to say thank you, Rashad and Becky, for grounding us in our purpose on why we are here today, and that's to craft our personal narrative. Kyle, thank you for moderating the conversation. Um, I want to repeat something that Becky's father said, and it's our pain, our painful, but our proud history that really stuck with me um, because it's our right to know the history of our country, regardless of how painful or shameful it is. Rashad said, what does it mean to fight? I want us all to think about that question that he asked us. What does it mean for us to fight, for you to fight? Um, 
there's a power in sharing our stories and we want to give you the tools to help amplifiers, not just at the school board meetings, y'all. We need to be at the gym. We need to be at the coffee shop. We need to talk with people that may not understand what is at stake for us. Like Rashad said, the best defense is offense. So let's get started on strategizing. Next slide. All right, so we are going to break some ice and get to know each other in our virtual space here. Um, we always do this at Color We Change. We know it's very important to, you know, break the ice, get to know one another, do some questions and feedback so that way we can get started on our workshop. The best storytelling workshops happen when you bring your voice into the room. We are going to start the training with engaging activity that I'm going to pass over to Sherelle to get us started. Good evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Sherelle Eubanks, and I'm a senior policy analyst at the National Education Association. I'm so excited to have you all here tonight. Um, Karina asked you some questions about where you were and as had you put in some pronouns, and we're going to find a little bit out a little bit more about you. So why don't you tell us um, in the chat? why you are here today. Are you here today because you're a parent, a grandparent or a guardian concerned about black history being erased in, in schools and in classrooms? Are you an educator that wants to ensure that black history is taught in the classroom? Are you a student who wants to learn the truth about history, everyone's history? Um, are you a concerned community member um, who wants to take a stand um, for black history or someone else. You see the um, letters there that correspond with um, the way you can tell us um, why you're here. Drop that in the chat. Sherelle, we have a lot of folks saying D. We have some folks saying B. Holly said A. I'm definitely glad to see that people, members of the community are just concerned and they may or may, they may have children who are grown. They may not, not have children in school, but they're here to defend their students um, in their community's right to um, and freedom to learn. Um, next slide, please. Thank you, Sherelle. So we're going to dive into question number two. Question number one for me was why I'm here today is I'm a parent um, of a Black son. I'm from Vallejo, California, but we actually moved to Benicia. Uh, Vallejo schools didn't have really proper educate public education. Um, so I had to move to a place that was predominantly white. And I think about all the time, how can I bring that culture into um, the school that he is now? How can I teach it at home? Because sometimes it's not taught at school. So Sherelle, thank you for leading that. And thank you all. Um, for putting it in the chat on what that means for you. Growing up, where did you learn about Black history, y'all? Was it A, from your family, B, in your school, C, both, or D, I didn't learn much about Black history? All right, I see someone said D, and that's where I hear that a lot. I hear that. I see some more Ds, all right? I see A and B. All right, I'm seeing D. Yes, um, Karina, I had to educate myself about Black history um, when I went to college. And then once I started to learn, you know, I just continued on the path. And, um, and then I made sure that my children um, were steeped in Black history um, as a parent. We read the books. We watched the movies. I even sat them down to watch the old roots before they remade yes, it. Yes, yes. I love that. I love that. Sherelle, passing it back to you for our third icebreaker question. Um, our third question is, um, what are you most concerned about in terms of defending Black history? Are you concerned about the book bans? Are you concerned about the limiting of courses? For example, the um, whether or not teachers can teach African-American history or ethnic studies. Um, are you concerned about textbook adoptions or textbooks that are whitewashing history or not providing accurate histories of, of um, Black folks and others? Or are you concerned about the policies in your district related to um, teaching history and books? Or are you concerned about all of these things? Let us know in the chat. All right. I'm seeing Teresa saying all of the above. I'm hearing Annette say B. Leah is all the above. I agree, Sherelle, um, with a lot of folks here. I'm all the above 
honestly, I am all the above. Um, and we're going to move into our next icebreaker question. So that way we can get started in the workshop. From today's workshop, y'all, what do you hope to gain? A, the ability to share a powerful story in a school board hearing. B, hope to train others to join on the fight. C, to be inspired by others and learn. And D, all the above. All right, I'm hearing all above. the above. Yes, I definitely see all of the above. All right, Steve hey, is saying D. Yes, I agree. And I was going to answer the question and say all of the above, y'all. But one of the big things that I want to take away today and want to encourage you all is like the school board. We're crafting this narrative for the school board trainer. But think about five people. Do you know five people in your phone right now that you can say, hey, I just took this bomb training that had a workshop. If you have an hour of your time, go through it, learn more about how you can get involved in your next school board meeting. There's tons of people on this call right now. But again, we can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. So think about five people in your phone right now who you want to ask to take action with. Think about when you go to the gym, who is that mom that you're always talking to in the sauna that you're like, hey, actually, I know your son goes to the same school as mine. This is what we have going on. So again, for me, I hope to train others to join me on this fight. And I hope that you all um, do the same. And I'm going to pass it over to Destiny uh, to talk about our personal stories and why we tell our stories. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Sherelle, Karina, Becky, Rashad, and Kyle for opening us up this evening. My name is Destiny, and I'm here to set the foundation in our understanding of why we tell stories and looking at storytelling as a leadership practice. Storytelling is something we're all hardwired to do. We're all shaped by the stories we tell and the stories we're told. In this session, we're going to aim to make the implicit explicit so we can tell our stories with more intentionality and help others do the same. But before we get started, I'd love to share my story with you. I grew up in the Kansas City School District and by the age of 10, I was pretty tired of all the labels I kept being boxed in. Terms like the school to prison pipeline didn't exist, but I knew I was a part of them coming into those terms coming to life. In the fifth grade, I found myself one of the few elementary students shipped off to their new K through 12 transition centers, an old musky abandoned building where I would spend probably half of my fifth grade year there. Ironically, the first time I ever told my story was in the fifth grade. It was actually at my graduation. Initially, I was told that due to my graduate, due to my suspension rate and my behavior patterns, I wasn't even allowed to attend. But once my basketball coach, Miss Bird, heard about it, she, and she got wind of this, she advocated to everyone in that school to ensure that I was able to participate, and she encouraged me to enter the essay contest. What I wasn't expecting was for my essay to win the, the submission and for me to be invited to read this essay in front of everyone at the school. With the reputation that preceded me, I was nervous to share. I still remember the butterflies in my stomach as I approached the podium. With the reputation that preceded me, and as I reached that podium, I told the most vulnerable story of my name, of my parents' addiction, and of the promises that I would make to myself, my hopes, and my dreams. I knew that despite what everyone thought, I had something to offer. And as I left that stage to a standing ovation, I knew that my parents were only products of society we lived in. And I challenge everyone in the room to think about that. When, we ask what, when you ask me what Black history means to me and what a quality education means to me, I think about my own father, who's 66 years old, who can't read or write, and the daily challenges and the impacts on his on his life and the legacy of slavery. I think about my grandfather, Fletcher, the sharecropper in Arkansas, who history lessons are currently being erased out of our textbooks and stories are under attack. Or my great grandfather, Sanford, a man born in 1865, who even if he lived to 100, I would have never met. I think about how important it is that we don't lose these lessons, <clears throat> these pieces of history. That's why we're fighting to keep Black history in our classrooms and on our bookshelves so we can learn from history's lessons. I knew at 10, we, the stories we were being told is a lie, and that's why we're here today. I believe that there's power in our stories, and I know that when we share them, we can change the world. 
today, I'm going to ask you all to do something with me. If you've ever ridden a bike, you know the first time is never perfect. Just like riding a bike in today's workshop, you can expect to try it out, practice, and learn from the craft. Just like riding a bike, you may feel a little unsteady in the first few turns of the pedal, but if you keep going, you're going to get it. So if you can commit to trying it out, practicing, and learning, drop a one in the chat for me. <clears throat> Awesome. Most of you guys should have received an email with the school board storytelling workshop document that we are going to work through today. We have our school board public comment template here that we'll really be building our training around. Speaking up at local school board meetings typically are limited to two to three minutes. So we're going to use this as our basis of our training today. Before we get started into the craft of story, I'm going to bring Sierra, my colleague, on stage to talk to you guys about the issues and framing them in your story. Thank you so much, Destiny, for sharing your story so vulnerably. Uh, we really appreciate you. And before we dive deeper into crafting our narrative and thinking through our stories, it's important to remember what we're fighting against and what is at stake. So for those that were at the training last week, this will be a bit of a recap of that time. So the issues, just to name a few, are the continued removal of Black and LGBTQ plus authored books from library shelves across the country. The truth is not being passed down, and when educators do resist these discriminatory standards, they're being attacked or worse, fired. As a result, the quality of education and academic curriculums are poor, and college readiness is hindered, and students are left with very limited course offerings. Not only is education being impacted, but Black children are experiencing environmental harm, infrastructures are crumbling, schools are next to metal plants, and the quality of food is poor. Next slide. So moving on to the facts, as many of you already know, weeks before Florida students return to school, the International Baccalaureate quietly signed an agreement with the Florida Department of Education, certifying that their courses exclude Black and queer experiences in accordance with the Don't Say Gay and Stop Woke laws. Since then, a number of professional organizations have released statements indicating that their courses are inaccurate and incomplete. To make matters worse, educators who attempt to supplement these incomplete curriculums could be jailed for up to five years under Florida law. Next slide as we continue on with the facts. Basically, we are up against a nationwide strategic movement of extremist group working hard to control what's taught in the classroom, what books can be read by students, what teachers can teach, all under the guise of fighting CRT, a college-level law theory course that is non-existent in K-12 schools. Since January 2021, 44 states have introduced measures to restrict or limit how educators may discuss racism, sexism, gender identity, and other issues of systemic inequality in the classroom. Banning books and conversations about systemic racism is systemic racism, and it disempowers the next generation of students. We all know that these are nothing more than the most recent attempts at erasing Black history from our classroom and then from our country. Next slide. Absent accurate Black history lessons is reason enough for why we must act. When our history is not present, Black students miss the opportunity for meaningful representation, and all students are denied the tools needed to examine and dismantle systems of, pressure, of oppression and power that hold us back. Next slide. When race and racism are not taught in schools, we all suffer. All children are robbed of an effective education, one that acknowledges the, new, the unique experiences of the Black community and allows children and, and you know, doesn't allow children to see themselves in one another. When Black children are, um, when black children are learning about black, about black history, student achievement improves. Black children can absolutely play a role in the fight for Black liberation. And these are just the facts, and it's honestly why we're all here today. So next slide. Um, so in our last training, we equipped y'all with a school board um, cheat sheet to identify the issues to help you prep uh, before you show up to your local school board hearing. So this is my personalized demo cheat sheet. Um, and just to offer a little bit of background, I went with Loudoun County, which is located in the Northern Virginia area because I myself am from Virginia and I've heard much about the reputation of their hearings. Over the past several years, um, many of the parents that show up to the hearings in Loudoun have been loud and aggressive about pushing back on Black history, 
being taught in their schools and to their children. They call themselves, they call this parental activism, and they believe teachers have been more, fo more focused on politics than on doing their jobs. These protests in Loudoun began making local news and word spread quickly throughout the state. This honestly just demonstrates more reason for us to show up to our local school board hearings because the opposition is certainly showing up to theirs. Um, so as I move through this cheat sheet, I use Loudoun County, uh, I use the Loudoun County Public Schools website to find these answers, and you can do the same with your local county website. As you can see on the first slide, I was able to identify who the new members are, who the president is, who where, uh, when the next election is. Um, because they just had an election last November of this year, the next election won't be until another four years in 2027. And then the new members will be voting um, for a president at the top of 2024. Next slide. Okay, and so this is my checklist to help prepare myself for showing up. I answered questions like, how long will I have to speak? One minute. Is there a virtual option? Yes. Obviously, these answers will differ from county to county, but moving through this checklist helped me prepare and feel confident. And as you can say, as you can see, I plan to show up to um, my school board hearing in January of 2024. So for the next slide, uh, some of these issue areas. Uh, so for me, these are some of the issue areas I want to be more informed about, like who is on the equity com uh, committee, what does the curriculum in Loudoun look like right now, and what actually qualifies someone to be on the board. And lastly, on this next slide, I thought through what is the harm. And so I grabbed this quote from a recent news article which states um, the congressman's goal. He says, as your congressman, I will take all the political agenda out of schools. He said, I would do that so that you, the parents, have control over what your children do and what they learn. Black history is being called a political agenda. Parents are deciding what they want their kids to learn or not learn based on what's, what makes them comfortable versus what is true. And so I said, this is why I need to defend black history. Also, as a side note, I really wanna encourage folks to be mindful of when elected officials use phrases like, it's a political agenda versus calling it what it is, which is black history, that's intentional rhetoric. So be on the lookout for bu uh, buzzwords and phrases like that. Um, and then finally, I wrote what needs to change and what's my vision. Ultimately, the way black history is viewed and is perceived as a threat needs to change. Black history is not a political issue and it needs to be taught. This is my vision and this is what I plan to share while I'm using my voice at my local school board hearing. And you can do the same as well. So now we're gonna dig into why it's so important that we share and listen to Black stories. Our goal of this workshop is to empower Black parents, students, and community members to have control over their narratives and to tell their own stories, um, and especially stories that build power. So up next, we'll be hearing a member story. Um, our elites have been working on, uh, have been working to tell their stories for this workshop. And I would like to open our uh, training with the first video from Monty. My name is Monty and I'm based in Columbus, Ohio. A few months ago, me and my son stood in line in the only early voting location in the largest county in Ohio. While we were standing in line, he asked me, mom, what are we voting for? And I told him again, the issue that we were voting on and the importance of voting. And he said, oh yeah, to protect black women. And I said, well, yes, of course, to protect black women, but in protecting black women, we're protecting all people. And he responded, well, yeah, but we have to protect black women more because black women have it worse. And I chuckled because his words were but a reflection of the many conversations, quotes, and discussions that he listened in on me discussing the many disparities that black women face, not only after a given childbirth, but in education, housing market, and other critical institutions that we need to survive. It was at this moment that I knew that I must not only fight for critical race theories and black studies in my own academic journey, but to also ensure that my son had access to a quality education to be taught accurate history. If something was to happen to me, who could I depend on to, to make sure that he was still aware of the many issues that are impacting marginalized communities in the world. 
while Black studies and critical race theory is being put forth as a divisive tool, as one that lacks any educational value and that causes harm or distress to others. While I'll admit that sometimes the truth is uncomfortable, I also know that the truth is also important to share. And that's why I share my story. Critical race theory is not a divisive tool or a tool that was brought forth to cause distress. Critical race theory is counter storytelling. It prioritizes recognizing the pervasiveness of racism and identifying and challenging white privilege. It's only when we study the issues that impact marginalized communities and black people the most is when we can really put forth true policies and true solutions to help them overcome these challenges. And this is why I share my story in hopes that it will inspire others to also share their story. Thank you so much. Um, as we get started on crafting your story, I hope everyone has a pen and paper handy so they can follow along. So as we get into the structure, there's the three key elements of a, a powerful story. Structure, which are the challenge, the choice, and the outcome. The emotions, the action, the hope, the values, and the feelings, and the moments. These are the vivid details telling us when and where, and being able to show us versus telling. To build a powerful stories that convey our values and call others to action, we're going to need all these ingredients. As we get into emo emotions, inform us about our values in ourselves, in our community, and in the world. Did you feel any emotions today as I shared my story or as Becky shared her story or even as Monty shared her story? Can you link it to any values, any common values through our stories? If you're ever having a hard time making a decision, what advice do people typically give you? Follow your heart, trust your gut. That's because our heart is a domain of wisdom and it's all known. It's kind of like our own form of guidance. So the heart work is the work that's gonna really motivate us and move us to care. And it's just as important as the head. We often understand, underestimate the value of emotions and the decisions and the choices we make every single day. The head of course is where we go to strategize, to figure out the things we're doing and how to achieve our goal. And it's important to note when we're thinking about bringing emotions into our story, that some emotions actually stop people from acting and there are others that enable folks to act. So bearing in mind that not em all emotions are created equal, we like to think about how we move from one emotion to the other end of an emo emotion range and plugging that into our story. For instance, some of these emotions that don't drive change are gonna be apathy, fear, isolation, maybe self-doubt, but on the other side of these emotions that stop us are the emotions that move us. Instead of apathy, we're having anger to change the thing, hope to combat the fear, solidarity in space in place of isolation and moving from self-doubt to self-worth. So now I, wanna, I want you guys to think about a time that you were able to move from one of these emotions to the other side. As we think about emotions and the role that they play in our stories, we're starting with emotions and moments before we get into the structure to just reiterate that moments bring us into the story. They, tell, they help you tell your story. They're gonna bring others into your story and they're gonna help other people better understand you. I never heard Becky's story before today and I definitely felt like I went on that trip with her. Um, just her pulling us into that moment. So when, and remember when you're crafting your narrative to think about painting, what are those pivotal moments in the story? What were those vivid details? When, where, showing versus telling and thinking about connecting those moments to your choices and your challenges. So as we think about the structure, every good story has a plot. In our own stories, in our own stories, we like to, we, excuse me, sorry. In our own stories, we want to identify a moment 
in our lives where we faced the challenge and we made an important choice and we had an outcome. And that outcome is maybe what led us here today. When you think about your challenge and framing it and putting together your story, you want to think you can ask yourself the questions of what was your challenge, maybe answering why it was your challenge. How did this challenge feel? That's going to bring you into the emotion, the emotion and the values um, and well, the emotion. And then why were you called to take action is going to bring you into the values around this challenge and the choice. As we get into the next part of our story structure, we get into choice. Choice points in our lives often shine like a light on our value and how they're formed. When did you first care about being heard or about an injustice you saw or experienced? What choice did you make in the face of great uncertainty? Now the task is to choose one of those moments. So I want you guys to start thinking about these choice moments and show us, don't tell us, but show us what those moments were and how that was a challenge. And one of those things that we talked about today around emotions is moving from an inhibiting emotion to an action emotion. So the question here around choice, um, because this is the space where we really think about hope, is where did you get the courage? Or if you didn't get the courage, how did you move from not having the courage to having the courage? And lastly, the final part of our structure, of our plot of our story, is of course our outcome. The next step is to really show how the choices that we made and the choices that we make continue to impact the work that we're doing today, or rather the outcome that we're hoping for and that we want others to join us in on, or the future that we are looking for. Um, so when you're thinking about outcome, I want you to think about what it is that you want to teach other people what maybe it was in that story that you learned that you're sharing? What did the outcome, asking yourself, what did the outcome feel like to you? And of course, thinking about what's happening right now and how this connects to the urgency of the moment and the story that you're telling. And just a couple of reminders that you're thinking about crafting your story, and I hope you are um, you have your worksheet up and you're thinking about these moments is to remember to share your experiences. It's really hard. Sometimes we all have a million stories in us, but pick one to three choice points um, that relate to your calling to be here today. Tell a person or at the day that you're showing up at the school board hearing, make sure your story is personal where you're the main character and be very specific, vivid and clear. And just remember, share a story that gives hope. As we um, move into the next part of this training, we're gonna bring Sherelle up so that way we can see how your testimony. Thank you, Destiny. So um, now we're gonna watch a powerful um, testimony um, by Toby Hedge Hedgepath. She is a parent in North Carolina who is a member of the Public School Strong North Carolina Co Coalition. In this testimony, you will hear um, the elements that Destiny just described. You will hear about um, Toby's why. Um, you will hear about her values as well as um, her calls to action. But before we um, do this, I would like to invite you to text FREEDOM to 48744 so that you can receive NEA's Freedom to Learn um, Toolkit, which includes additional resources to help you defend Black history in your community. Um, if you attended our event last week, you might have um, uh, done this text. And I know at this one point in time, it was not working, but it is working today. And so we invite you to text and so that you can continue to receive resources and updates about how you can defend Black history. and. Um, Aaron, you can show the video now. Hello, commissioners. My name is Toby Hedgepath, and I live in Whitsett, North Carolina. My two boys attend Sedalia Elementary and Guilford, um, Eastern Guilford Middle School, soon to be fifth and eighth graders. 
My husband and I are graduates of GCS as well. So I stand here today speaking through my lens as a mom of students, a prior student, and a member of Public School Strong. I've worked for almost 20 years as a human resources professional in higher education, and I appreciate the role that I have as a spokesperson for employees who aren't able or don't always feel empowered to speak up for themselves. So today I stand before you to speak up for my boys and my friends and my family who are teachers and classified workers with Guilford County Schools. I'm eternally grateful for those teachers and staff who care for my boys as they grew and found their way over the years and especially for one of our previous custodians who was such a positive presence in the lives of my boys that they saw him as a teacher and I never changed that for them. I became a member of Public School Strong because I wanted to be a part of the discussions happening to make the school system better and more sustainable. And it's important for me as a parent who bring, to bring solutions and Public School Strong has given me an opportunity to understand the issues, ask questions, and be a part of solution building that helps us all. I'm extremely grateful for the collaboration and hard work of all who have been a part of these wage discussions, while knowing that there's still so much work to be done. We must stand together to push back on legislation that harms future funding of Guilford County Schools, such as the voucher bill which I'm excited to see that the Board of Education has submitted a resolution against this bill that would drain much needed funding from North Carolina schools. And I'm excited for our county commissioners to join with them and take a stand. On its surface, it sounds reasonable, but as we dig into the details of this bill, we see the dollars that could have been allocated for our community schools are now funneled into private schools that aren't a part of our community. Our taxpayer dollars are taken from the places where we live to build up schools that have a choice of whether or not to accept our students and our children. When will we activate the lessons that we learned as children and young adults that the grass is only greenest where we water? We can either water the lawns of our private schools or we can water the lawns of our public schools where our children are diverse and curious and able and, and they can see representation in the faces of the teachers and the staff that stand before them each day. And finally, can we look for alternative ways of funding education? We know a few years ago that the school bond referendum passed, but the percentage sales and use tax did not. We must do a better job at communicating how these are one. This fight is exhausting and I have not fought nearly as enough as the individuals sitting here today. No one should have to hold rallies and push for a sustainable living wage. No one should have to decide if they will pay rent or buy food. Our teachers, staff, and families supported by them should never feel like the only way to live is to leave. Thank you. What a powerful school board testimony example. All right. Hey, thank you so much. We're going to move into our next portion of the training here. And welcome Cedric Nelms to the stage. In this next portion of the training today, we're going to go through crafting our story with the live demo. Um, Cedric is here joining us. So I want to give Cedric a minute to introduce himself to the group. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Cedric, welcome. Thank you, Destiny. I think and, you're on mute. Uh, uh oh, to the color of change, uh, folks. Can you hear me? Okay, good. So, all right, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, no, Cedric Nelms. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles, California. I'm a community organizer with an organization called Innovate uh, Schools, uh, where we are doing work around educational equity in the public school sector. Uh, and so, I do a lot of work uh, with Black and Brown. Uh, parents, but mostly with Black parents uh, throughout Los Angeles County. Uh, and so I'm just glad to be here with the Color of Change family and with Destiny and uh, seeing how we can organize and mobilize and advocate for our respective communities. Thank you so much for introducing yourself and letting folks know a little bit about you. Um, I want to move into our session today. Um, again, thank you for joining us. What, when you look around, what would you say is at stake for students in the Los Angeles community? Uh, pretty much what it is. 
go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I, I think pretty much what uh, we find in most communities uh, in major cities, um, you know, there's an anti-blackness that's going on in um, most of our local school sites. And um, yeah, the quality of education is is lessened um, or decreased. Uh, the terminology that we hear here in Los Angeles is uh, lowest performing subgroups, which is kind of disturbing. Uh, and so they're, they're always trying to move the academic scale lower uh, in which that impacts black student achievement. And nobody is really focusing on black student achievement outside of just being a check box and not really applied and looked into. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about what's compelling you to organize around the black student achievement specifically here in Los Angeles? Yeah, I would. I mean, I would just say I'm I'm a product of public schools. I grew up in Los Angeles, born and raised. Uh, so I went to public school. I did do some private schools. Uh, I have five uh, uh, beautiful children who who went to uh, public schools and charter schools and private schools as well. Uh, but for me, it's just really looking at okay, what uh, what can we do for the next generation? Uh, eventually, I look forward to having some uh, some grandchildren, and I, I want their educational experience to be. Uh, all that it can be. Uh, and the term that I, I use quite often is I want to be sure that Black students have options. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. We're going to move into the next part of this worksheet. And audience, I want you to take a minute to make sure that you're jotting down what's at stake in your community. If there's a specific local fight that is ringing or coming to mind, make sure you're jotting that down as you're thinking about crafting out your story. Um, Cedric, this next part of the worksheet, I want to ask you in what ways does this personally impact you? I know we worked through this a little bit, but can you kind of identify your challenge, your choice, and your outcome as it pertains to your story um, with us? Yeah, just real quick. Um, yeah, I have, like I said, I have five children. Two of my five uh, uh, were, uh, my oldest son uh, was tested. Uh, uh, has autism, uh, but he has Asperger's, which is a high, he's highly functional. Uh, and then my youngest daughter has an IEP in place, an individual, individualized educational plan, uh, because she just, she learns different. Uh, so that means she got pulled out of class and uh, for testing and uh, extra reading and uh, uh, projects that may be given, she was given extra, extra time. Her IEP is still in place. Uh, and she's in college now. Um, and my oldest son uh, is is doing well. So that that was the challenge when those when when two of my five were in school, we had to advocate for them. Uh, they wanted to put both of them in special education, and we fought to say no. They need to be in in regular classes uh, and learn at the pace like everyone else. Um, and so we had to advocate for that. At the same time, we found support. Uh, through principals and teachers and administrators at their schools that really got behind uh, uh, our efforts. Um, and yeah, that helped with them thriving uh, at their own level. Uh, they are successful and will continue to be successful in life uh, because we stepped up and we fought for them and we showed up. I think that's the biggest thing is we advocated and we showed up. Uh, as my grandfather says, the, 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 the squeaky wheel gets the most attention. And so uh, we were the squeaky wheels. Thank you so much. Such a powerful story and such a powerful example of just your advocacy in the community. Um, we're going to move into the next part of the training, but I want to thank you for just hopping on and sharing your story with us and connecting. Um, after this training, folks will be able to look through this information and see a little bit more of how you can plot out your story. But thanks so much for coming to the stage, Cedric. We're going to move into the um, next part of the training. All right, everyone, we are getting close to time, but we are going to make the time so that way we can ensure that we can get into these storytelling sessions. For the next 15 minutes, we're going to spend time hearing from some of the voices in the room today. Um, each, each session is going to have about 50 folks. Well, I'm not looking at the math right now, but there's a limit of about 50 folks. 
Um, and each session, again, if you are a willing participant, when you go into this space, you're going to be greeted by your session moderators. Cedric is one. Um, I'll be one. Sarissa, Sherelle, Sierra, and Karina, you'll be able to join us in these sessions. And um, as we get into the sessions, it will be a very, you know, we'll welcome you. If you are a willing participant who is ready to just jump on the bike and share a little bit about their story, we have three minutes on the floor for you. And we are going to be going into our sessions by region. This screen is going to stay locked. But on the left hand side of the screen today, you guys should see access to go into the storytelling workshops. I mean, to the session, um, storytelling sessions. So I hope to see you guys in the sessions and I'm going to actually hop over to my session.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. I hope that you had a good experience. If you can, drop it in the chat about your experience. I know for me, y'all, I was having technical difficulties. I could not figure out where my session was. So if you were in session, session six, I apologize, but there is definitely going to be another opportunity, more opportunities for us to engage with one another, for me to hear your story, for me to coach you on your story. So just want to apologize about that mishap. Um, but want to say thank you all for joining and hanging in there. Hop in for us is a new platform that we are using. If you've been with us before, we have used Zoom, but now we're trying to figure out a new way to engage with you all. So despite my difficulties, and if you all had any difficulties, we appreciate the grace as we figure out how to navigate this new normal. Um, so I want everyone to take some action right now. On the left side of your computer, on your phone, you should be able to click a link where you can share your story. And again, I know we only had about 10 -ish minutes or even less in the sessions. We did want to do a little bit longer, but we try to start on time and end on time. We know it's dinner time and all those great things. So again, if you were not able to get through the full thing, just know there's going to be a follow-up. Desi and I um, and Sierra are going to be having one-on-one -on -one with folks to help craft that story. So again, you are not alone. This is not in here. Um, but I wanted to review the learnings. Next slide. So again, why do we share our stories? To shift the narrative, to tap into our power, to say, I have a story, this story matters, and it helps us connect with one another. Also, reflect on the stories that stood out to you today and why. Did you hear anything compelling in your um, session? Did you hear anyone that had a similar story or something that was completely different? Do you have any questions for them? Try to remember their names so that way when we come back together, you all can kind of talk about that and think through how you all can help build power together. Even if I'm in California and someone's in Florida, you know, this is a nationwide fight and we need everyone in all hands on deck. Um, did you take note or what notes did you take? What did you hear? Did you hear the challenge? Did you hear the choice? Did you hear the hope? Did you see the values? And when I think about my uh, storytelling coach, he always said, show me, Karina. Don't tell me what happens, but show me exactly what happened. Bring me into that classroom, right? Bring me out to the podium. So I just want to say, again, thank you all for getting on the bike, as Destiny would call it, to think through ways to really empower yourself to share your story in a very strategic way. Um, we are here to organize a fight. We are here to pull up at our school board meeting to tell folks what we need and what our friends and our family and our community needs, right? There's ways you can also take charge by creating your own campaign on Organize4. You can complete COC's Defend Black History Story Chaining Worksheet and check out our additional resources. There will be an email that goes out. Continue showing up for our trainings and in our meetings. Next step for us, again, text squad to 55156. I see North Carolina in the house. I see Florida. I see California. I see New York. I see Detroit. I see all these places where we actually have squads and we're really trying to rethink and rebuild and reimagine how we do our squads, right? So if you are here with us today and you've been a part of a squad, um, I know someone said, hey, we had a Juneteenth event last year, but we didn't have one this year. So again, we are getting on the bike with y'all. We are trying to figure out this new normal for us and how we navigate program and organizing. But I want to thank you all for ending December on a high note for allowing us to engage with you all and give us the tools, give you all the tools that are needed to defend Black history. Happy Wednesday, y'all. Enjoy your dinner and thank you for joining.